I am Dharmala Shri from Smart Leaders IAS. I am going to take uh, editorials from the fourth week of January. So my first article is about OIS linkage with the primary healthcare centers. So let us move on to discussion now. Here the outline of the article is about why IOS doctors can be linked to the primary healthcare centers. So let us see what is Ayush first. So in Ayush, A stands for Ayurveda and Y stands for Yoga and U stands for Yunani and S stands for Siddha and H for Homeopathy. So in India, we are following three types of public health care system and uh, it is in the hierarchy. Move on to what is the three types of public health care system. So the first one is primary health care center and the second one is secondary and third one is tertiary. As the name suggests that it's a primary health care center, uh, here it is the first point of contact from the patients. And here normally basic ailments will be given. Will be given and from here the secondary healthcare centers will be there so here some surgery things and all will take in place and the third one is tertiary so here long-term medications are taken care of here as like TB and all diabetes everything okay so in India the primary healthcare center as I told it is a first point of consultation for all patients it deals with the immunization, child vaccine and uh, minor ailments and uh, as well as natal and the postnatal care. So here in India, it widens the scope as for primary health care center as it is the first point of contact for the patients. So uh, it is often called as a local community model. In India, uh, it was recommended by the board committee from 1946. So the primary health care center, the present scenario, it is very grim because of its disparity and the diversity. So in India, 8% of the primary health care centers are running without doctors and 32% of the primary health care centers are located very deep, that is in tribal areas and as well as remote areas. So in urban areas, location of primary health care centers are available, but they are very highly skewed. So two thirds of population in urban area are out of purview. And the rural area, they are suffering four times more than the urban areas in terms of accessibility alone. So, and apart from that, hospital to bed ratio is highly inadequate in our country. So, let us move on to the article now. So, in this article says that National Medical Bill 2017, which say it recommends a specific bridge course for Irish doctors properly taking care of the primary health care center. So, is that the only National Medical Bill Commission has stated this specific bridge course? Apart from National Medical Commission, there are so many uh, other articles also mentioned about this thing. So, National Health Policy 2017, and they have said that OIS doctors can be uh, upgraded so that they can be treat, uh, given to the primary health care centers. And the fourth common review report 2010 of National Health Mission also suggests the same. And apart from that, Sailaja Chandra report 2013, and it stayed uh, on its report, status of Indian medicine and folk healing. So already some states like Maharashtra and Chhattisgarh are doing the this cross prescription. So how this bridge course will help in the primary health care center? According to author, uh, as of now, our doctors to patient ratio, it is 0 0.76 per thousand population, especially in our primary health care center. It is highly less than the WHO recommendation. So also, we have the more supply in terms of OIS doctors. More than 7.7 lakh registered OIS practitioners are available in India, according to the National Health Profile Data 2017. And conventional biomedical syllabus of OIS it is very easy for the OIS doctors to upgrade to the uh, levels of MBBS doctors. So, and also we have urgent and uh, urgent demand for acute and emergency care at the primary level. It needs to be at attacked first. And if you are allowing the OIS doctors to give the modern medicine without any training, it will become deterrent. 
and as happened in some cases like Chhattisgarh also, in especially in the tribal areas. So we need a proper training to be given to Osh doctors so that they can be allowed to prescribe the modern medicines. So whether this will be a panacea, author says that yes, this will be a panacea. It is not alone the panacea because it is one of the multi-pronged efforts to achieve the universal health coverage. It is our mission. So in the long run, pluralistic and integrated medical system of India will be happen. So in this integrated medical system, so let us move on to the reality. First one is, it is a highly degrading step towards Aish because Aish doctors are highly protest because the level has been downgraded. After this recommendation, Aish doctors are treated with ASHA in a primary healthcare centers. And uh, apart from the Aish doctors, allopathic practitioners are also not favoring this option because Indian Medical Association said it is an anti-patient and a pro-private and how will you mix these two systems because OSH is about more traditional medicine system and MBBS is about modern medicine system. So they are saying that it is unscientific mix of two systems. Apart from this, role of traditional medicine system will be vanished. So in the dependency of the medicines from western countries will be high hereafter and the availability of the affordable medicines to the common man will be a question mark. And and as we have seen in the Sangli, Maharashtra, abortion was happened, death due to the illegal abortion because uh, it, uh, it is done by a homeopath doctor who is not licensed to do that. Uh, so the chances of misusing the license will be more after if we are allowing the OIS doctors to take in care of the modern medicine. And we know that capacity building of primary healthcare is our point now. So the capacity building of healthcare will not be solved only with the cross prescription of OIS doctors inducted into the me uh, modern medicine practitioners. So what we need to do to improve our capacity building of primary healthcare center. The first one, we can allow the OIS doctors to carry out the same OIS practices uh, that is they can prescribe their own traditional medicines in our primary health care centers. So say it is a responsibility of the state government as we all know health is a state subject. So state government responsibility to know the vacancies in some areas maybe the Ayurveda will have more vacancy in some areas Siddha will have the more vacancies. So it's a state government to cater to the needs so they need to throw in the vacancies open because we have more supply of, of OIS doctors as of now. And the second one is our National Health Policy 2017. Objective is we need to turn the primary healthcare centers into a wellness center. If we are planning to turn an, uh, primary healthcare centers into a holistic wellness center or uh, without the yoga and the Arvaita, it is not possible. So, this cross prescription is highly contradicts with this National Health Policy objective. And the third one is as, as of now, the number of medical professionals in modern medicine, it is inadequate. So we need to increase to the urgent demand. So we need to provide more supply. And the fourth one is increasing the nurses availability in the primary health care center to be tripled. As of now, we have one, uh, one nurse per PHC. So it needs to be tripled. And the main part, it is a financial part. So our 2017 national health policy we are aiming for 2.5 percent of health spending in 2025 but we need to implement from this budget as well the next one is infrastructure or uh, as of now we are having somewhere around 27,000 on 700 and primary health care centers in our country we are in short of more than 3,800 primary health care center so uh, more number of primary health care centers we need to open and the second point is connectivity to the primary health care center because to deeper packets, if we want to open the primary health care centers, we need the connectivity like digital as well as physical as of now. And the fourth one is how we are going to utilize the public-private partnership in the uh, primary health care center. So they can be effectively utilized in the health information management and the research and lab facilities and providing auditing and support and all. They can provide the technical support as well. And the next one is restructuring of medical education. It is a high end demand now and the location of the colleges also need to cater the geographical disparity so the next one is the availability of medical professionals in our primary health care centers is is need to be 24 into 7 so we need one doctor and one uh, nurse availability in in the phds 
so incuban model uh, called family doctor concept it is highly successful and we have tried in kerala also so kerala model of phg following this cuban model is very highly effective and uh, also the success of the kerala model depends on the other aspect the strong cooperation from the panchayat it is a third tier of a gana system and fourth one is availability of medicine services provided in the primary health care center so accountability can be done by district level monitoring independent agency so they they have some uh, responsibility and accountability at the local level and the fourth one is we can go for social auditing here we can link the panchayats and the people so as we know that the health is a topic on our gs2 so in 2015 the same related public health care uh, delivery system so the question is we have public health system has limitations in providing universal health coverage so do we think that the private sector could help in bridging the gap so what are the viable alternatives would you suggest so it it has come in 2015 so we can expect the similar type of questions how to build the capacity building in our primary health care center maybe in our uh, 2018 exam also with respect to health we can have uh, broadly three four areas so the public health care delivery system and the policies like last year they have uh, 2016 they have asked national child policy so we can expect national health policy also 2017 and uh, the role of private and the children and is there any disease and in which india we need to eradicate now let us move on to our second topic now so it is march to hindustan which came on 23rd january so this article is about language policy of india so let us move on to the article now so in our syllabus in gs2 we have the government policies and intervention in that language policy can be an area what is this article is hindi is fear to be subsuming many sub national identities in the country that is in simple one language is trying to dominate many other regional languages that is what the crux of this article so first let us see what is a language policy so we all know that language is a mean of communication and it is a most important link between an individual and the society so a language policy is multi dimensional so language policies are basically designed to promote one or more languages and also to specify the usage of that language in different domains like education administration mainly like administration purposes uh, etc so it has an active role in domains like home school religion workplace supranational groupings so uh, article says that official language resolution act 1968 has come so in the three language formula was introduced so uh, it the three language formula was introduced all over india for northern states especially hindi speaking states modern indian language preferably one of the south indian language has to be uh, learned and uh, along with hindi and english so it was the condition for hindi speaking states and that hindi should be studied in the south indian states along with the regional languages and english but what happened to this three language formula which was introduced in the official resolution act 1960 so what happened non hindi speaking states except tamil nadu adhered to the three language policy we all know that tamil nadu follows only two language policy hindi speaking states took a u turn now here this non hindi language in the schools were were given up and not only that but hindi becomes predominant and english also delegitimized by the hindi speaking states and the next author sponsored on committee of parliament on official language 2011 was set up committee of parliament on official language 2011 the next point uh, author brings out about recommendations of committee of parliament on official language 2011 it uh, the main recommendations are the committee of parliament on official language 2011 and it was mainly appointed uh, to review the progress made in the use of hindi for the official purpose of the union and the second one is the committee operates not only to promote hindi everywhere but also to banish english from the land and the third one is hindi cannot uh, the committee believes that hindi cannot thrive as long as english serves so the recommendations done by the committee are a uh, main one is column in hindi fluency in annual confidential report of all employees and officers 
that is when you are providing your key results area in that your on your employees that you have a column of hindi fluency based on that your performance will be measured and the second one is is only hindi or one's mother tongue as a language to be used in the parliament so these two are highly critical recommendations given by the committee of parliament in 2011 and the author says there are two factors are relevant to our language policy because one english has become a global language so the mobility as well as for access of the global knowledge english become predominant now and the hindi possesses no such advantage so the second point author is saying about non hindi indian languages they are older than hindi language and their speakers are justly proud about the rich culture and literary heritage so they strive to make their respective languages prominent in governance and education recently telangana also promoted or uh, the telugu language as a mandatory and the last one is these states lack both desire and the need to learn hindi so they don't have any desire to learn hindi and the need to learn hindi because they can be substituted with english language so what will be the consequences of this Uh, predominance of one language over the other in our uh, pluralistic country like india so the first point is linguistic chauvinism it is hampering our multilingual essence of our country uh, it is very highly critical because it poses a danger to our federal structure and the second one is children's cognitive ability in school so a learning through mother tongue will improve our uh, cognitive ability of our children so it can come under a bigger strain because ability of our children and is is not up to the mark so in this we are affecting the constitutional right which is given to our uh, children and a constitutional bench of court held in 2014 karnataka versus recognized unaided school they says that even for a linguistic minorities it is the fundamental rights of the parents to determine what their mother tongue is so every children has a right to learn in her mother tongue so these are the complications which involving this prominence of one uh, language over the other language in our country so we need to be very cautious in implementing our language policies and the recommendations of committee of parliament 2011 India we are following this language policy under part 17 which became absolute now more than 50 years so but we need to respect the regional languages and their sensitivity and their legitimized concerns and the importance of english language as we are going more global and we have more economy linked to with english language fluency and the third one is we need to learn hindi without any par so we need to follow this three language policy in all the occasions we are following and our next topic is about road safety which came on 24th january so what is this article about how this motor vehicle amendment bill 2017 is linked to road safety how it is more focusing on road safety so let us move on to topic so we know that our infrastructure is from gs3 so and also it is big, it is a part of urbanization so gs1 also can be cited here so what is this need of road safety so india is growing more urban so growing urbanization is a first need and growing urbanization it is also multiplied with the number of vehicles so registration uh, number of registered motor vehicles it is 123% of growth from 2005 to 2013 so more number of vehicles uh, and more urbanization and it also resulted in more number of accidents so ac- fatalities increased by 54% in the same period so since 2008 india the children and uh, who have lost their lives in roads were 55000 so it is very high number and who uh, says that 3% of our uh, gdp is lost because of the uh, inadequate roads and the fourth one motor vehicle act 1988 it's a, it is a primary central legislation that regulates licensing and registration of motor vehicles and drivers so it is not up to the mark as of now so we need to upgrade the motor vehicle amendment act 1988 so here comes the amendment bill what are the highlights of the bill it speaks about licensing so driving licensing and the uniform licensing and the second one it says that other is mandatory for all the licensing and the third one it speaks about aggregator licenses aggregators like cab service providers uh, such as uber and all and the fourth one it says about recall of vehicles 
and the fifth one it speaks about the protection of good samaritans in case of any road accident happens and how the good samaritans will be protected and fifth one it sees uh, it says about the digitization that is use of electronic device in making our uh, roads safe and the sixth one is children so this is the first uh, piece of legislation in our uh, transport policy focusing more on children and the seventh one uh, we all know this penalties were increased to a very high range and the last one is compensation and the insurance it goes for uh, fullest compensation and uh, and the third party insurance so here all these five areas are uh, focusing mainly on road safety where motor vehicle amendment bill 2017 becomes more important for our uh, road safety what are the lacunae in the present system and we all know that our licensing is not uniform so there are so many number of licensing uh, system that is multiple licensing as followed and the procedures are manual and highly inefficient so uh, we cannot cater more than 5 lakh per month and the penalties we are given is very low as far as the committee concerned and and the 7% of deaths were children and how this motor vehicle amendment bill will work so first the author says that it is digitization so we have seen that electronic devices will will be helpful so city surveillance and the traffic monitoring system will be done through the electronic devices so the automated traffic enforcement system to detect the traffic light violations as well as speeding so it is already tested in kerala so it is a replication of kerala model all over india and the second one is who recommendation as is a child resistance system in vehicle so it will decrease the risk of uh, deaths of children okay and uh, because 70% uh, for infants and 54 to 80% for small children child resistance system is recommended by the who and we are going to implement through this motor vehicle amendment bill 2017 and uh, apart from the uh, drivers the protecting headgears for all children and uh, there is an accountability part mentioned in this bill about the juvenile driving who is responsible their guardians and parents are were accountable to the juvenile driving so uh, this article has another highlights it is a penalty which is given for the behavior because of our behavior we have been the reason for more number of fatalities and uh, injuries in the roads for the past more than 50 years so first time um, it is attacking uh, the behavior it is actually a penalty for our uh, so first one and it is uh, drunk driving so drunken driving uh, 10000 rupees for the first offense and the 15000 for the subsequent one and the second one is if you are over speed so it is 1000 for the light motor vehicle and 2000 to 4000 for medium and the heavy motor vehicle and the third one is, is if you are uh, not using helmets or uh, not wearing seat belts it is uh, fine is increased to 1000 so by using the penalty we are uh, it is actually a reason for a deterrent now let us see what is the criticism against this motor vehicle amendment bill so the first criticism is there is no special agency for road safety so there is no responsibility by the agency sundar committee recommended road safety and traffic management board at national and the state level the motor vehicle amendment bill is mainly based on the recommendations of sundar committee which was appointed on 2003 to 8 so but this aspect is missed in in this current version of the bill and the second one is lack of clarity on the central guidelines provided by the taxi aggregators as of now taxi aggregators had to follow the uh, procedures given by the states but this bill gives that central guidelines will be given by that the central guidelines state has to follow but standing committee recommended it would be optional for the states to follow the central government guidelines so the third one is it, there is no clarity about motor vehicle accident funds sourcing and the victim compensation with respect to sourcing is there any cess will be provided or no it is not clear clearly mentioned in this bill and the next one is victim compensation here or uh, whether full or half so who will be the partners and all are not clear and the fourth one is limited liability on the insurance company so insurance company can provide at up to 10 lakh uh, for the victims so apart from the me- uh, areas mentioned on our motor vehicle amendment bills there are some other areas also so we need to focus on those areas to make our road safe so the other areas like 
Like we uh, need accountable and the professional police force. Recently, there are so much criticism about the po police forces and the traffic management system. And the next one is design and engineering of roads. It is highly critical. And the Sweden is the best example for this. And the standing committee recommended the following of Sweden way or Australian way in the designing and engineering aspect because they are accounting in the human errors up to three percent and in the design itself. And the third one is effective enforcement. We have the usual criticism on the Indian policies. We are good in the policy making and ineffective in the enforcement. So we need to attack that usual evil. And the fourth one is the role of state government is highly critical because they are going to be implementers in this motor vehicle amendment bill. And the fourth one is we don't have any proper data about the accidents and the fatalities. Even though the Supreme Court provided guidelines on the Good Samaritan Act from year 2015, it is still not at um, fruitfully implemented because we don't have any proper data uh, maintained by our police forces. Maximum 70% of the accidents are reported because of driver. So driver's carelessness and all. So proper investigation of the data needs to be done and the proper recording of the data has to be done. So it can be done through our uh, digital technologies which we are going to use in this motor vehicle amendment bill. And we have our commitment in the Brasilia declaration by 2020 number of crash fatalities and the serious injuries to be reduced by 50 percent so we cannot realize this uh, commitment without upgrading the motor vehicle amendment bill 2017 so we need to focus on that and above all connectivity is the artery of our nation's development we cannot undermine the connectivity and the loss of lives in such a high ratio so very related question asked in 2014 a uh, national urban transport policy its emphasis how it is moving people instead of moving vehicles so the question is discuss critically the success of various strategies of the government in moving people instead of moving vehicles so the question is very direct so we can expect the similar question about motor vehicle amendment bill itself now we move on to our next article so the next article came on 25th january so this article topic is the art to south asia so it is speaking about charting of india asian agenda for future cooperation so in our syllabus international relations and the regional groupings we can expect asian directly because this year is our landmark year for india i mean 2017 is a landmark year for india because india and asian commended commemorated 25th year of their partnership and the 15 years of summit level interaction and five years of strategic partnership so we can expect a highly possible question in this area so these are the list of 10 asian countries we all know uh, asian is a group of 10 countries in the archipelago of indonesia so these are the list of 10 countries indonesia singapore philippines malaysia brunei thailand cambodia lavo and the myanmar and vietnam so what does this article says so let us move on to article now what does this article says so article says that but uh, it is a challenge so we we are facing so many challenges in charting out this roadmap because we are going, going to look about the next step that is the first point and the second one is the present situation is very unprecedented so geopolitical flux in the in the wider indo-pacific so we need to be more cautious and the third one is our past relation we uh, has some areas of disillusionment so we need to overcome mm, on both sides india and asian as well and above all, uh, the strategical significance with respect to Asian we need to address. As of now, we are focusing in from SAR towards BIMSTIC and we are evolving our central role uh, in the Indo-Pacific. And the contender to the place is China and China is actively involving South China Sea and it consider South China Sea as its own backyard and we are facing so many number of issues related to the South China Sea. So what are the concerns, I mean the past disillusionments between India and the Asia? Asia says that India is punching much below its weight in the region. So it is a concern of Asia. And the New Delhi says that it is uh, Asia relies India only when it is needed. I mean when it is sensitive to the other powers indirectly referencing uh, reference to China. So that time they needs, uh, they are relying India. So as once Singapore uh, 
ex president says that india is the only country which can counterbalance china in the region so the interest and the expectations of the two sides which is remain far from the other so we need to overcome that so we need to address as a realistic assessments and uh, provide uh, the conversations so we all know that from 2014 we have shifted from locust policy towards actist policy and the main objective of actist policy is to enhance india's strategic profile in east and the south of asia but what happened really is we are focusing more on south asia and the indian ocean region so this is the main criticism uh, on uh, actist policy and we all know that actist policy is one of our key pillar in the relation with respect to asia so we need to activate actist policy now but and author says that we have some temptation with uh, with respect to this activation mode because we are recognizing myanmar and thailand in the southeastern outreach because they were the part of bimstick so our hope is to use these nation as a bridge to asia so myanmar and thailand via bimstick so the hope to use these nation as a bridge to asia via bimstick so because of our temptation we need to provide more and more uh, priority to these countries it may prevent other countries to engage with us so we need to be very cautious in dealing with our bridge countries like myanmar and thailand and and with the other asian countries they are also equally important to us so author uh, is providing three point solution that is three c's he is focusing so the first one is commerce and the second one is connectivity and the third one is culture so how this three c's will be working so we'll see the uh, first part commerce so first we we'll see about the commerce so economic relation with respect to india and asian as if now it is 70 billion dollar so we need to improve this and the second part is we are providing uh, 500 crores to develop cmlv countries like uh, cambodia myanmar laos and vietnam to become a manufacturing hubs so this is the present situation with respect to economic relation um, and what are the steps we need to take for our future roadmap so the first part is, is we need to our strength is digital so we need to focus more on the digital technology so in this digital technology we can not only encounter the challenge of china but also provide economic guarantor of its own the next area in our economic relation is the regional uh, regional comprehensive economic partnership but it is a negotiation as of now so we need to be cautious in dealing with rcp because we are fearing of signing fta with china so it needs to be dealt so coming to the next c the second one is the connectivity so here connectivity speaks about mainly about transport architecture so in transport architecture roadways rails roads seaways and airways so in roadways as we have a grand plan about now the uh, india myanmar and thailand highway so thai little highway from morak to mysore in uh, thailand and uh, now we are go- planning for extension of uh, mysore to um, cambodia laos and vietnam so this is the grand plan of our road connectivity and we need to implement this very fast it is already delayed and the next one is flight connectivity uh flight connectivity china provides three times more connectivity than india so we need to provide more air connectivity to each of asian countries and more and the number of frequency should be increased so this is our important uh, area of concern and the third one is maritime connectivity so maritime connectivity the um, potential of cruise tourism is more and we need to explore this area of cruise tourism um, in the maritime connectivity and the fourth one, and the next uh, apart from the transport architecture the next aspect of connectivity is digital connectivity we are planning for digital connectivity to the asian countries so we need to uh, uh, use this opportunity so last part of our c is culture part that india and asian are sharing their values and the religion and more than 2000 years so we have the strong hinduism and the buddhist connect in the region and uh, in the uh, from the nalanda project we are allowing asian students to come and study in the nalanda university and now we need to improve this in education in iims and iits to open to the asian students this article came on uh, 25th jan a little before than delhi declaration 
and uh, more restoration works we are doing as of now to Cambo uh, Cambodia. So we need to focus more on that. In the important strength and culture is Indian diaspora. So we need to follow effective diasporic diplomacy in, in the in Asian countries. So the fifth one is language power. Many Indian languages can be uh, are recognized as an official language in countries like Singapore and uh, other countries. So the language connect is is very deep in uh, in with respect to Asian. So we need to utilize the power of language. And the f last one is the destination. As of now, Asian is overtaking Europe as a film destination for Bollywood. Uh, so we need to utilize this opportunity. And we have more number of fans in the Asian countries. Um, so we need to utilize this opportunity as well. So our future roadmap should be uh, focusing more about functional cooperation and so that make the idea of an Asia-Indian partnership more exciting. So let us see the previous year questions which asked in 2017 and 2016. So this year 2017 it speaks about in Indian diaspora. So it is Indian diaspora has an important role to play in Southeast Asian countries' economy and society. So, apprise the role of Indian diaspora in Southeast Asia in this context. So, we can expect a uh, direct question with respect to Asian also, so, or Asian with language also. And the next question asked in 2016 is, Econo evaluate the economic and strategic dimensions of India's lookist policy in the context of the post-Cold Cold War international scenario. So, now we can ask uh, assessment of act as policy also next article which came on 29th january it is about uh, rebuilding our cities uh, so let us move on to the article now so the article says about revitalization of indian cities in a more inclusive way so we all know that at uh, urbanization it is in the part gs1 and and uh, infrastructure is in gs3 we need to give more importance to the article so let us move on to the article now. So Arthur says that uh, the present condition of our modern Indian cities are highly pathetic. Like, uh, so he cited Delhi, which has the largest urban poor population. More than 80% of Delhi's population is uh, poor. So it is very high with respect to the world itself. And the second one is Mumbai, which is uh, very close to Delhi in terms of Indian uh, situation. So what does this show? So inequality is highly growing and due to the impact of globalization and uh, we can see two pockets were improved because of this growing inequality one is middle class and the poor both were uh, depending upon uh, depending on the government one or the other ways one is expecting a high rise in the standards and all and the other one is um, depending the government and uh, there are other other pocket which is very small uh, and uh, elite pocket so this small exclusive elite it is outside of the civic forces so now we need to focus more on the middle class and the poor are located in the city so the other is giving three approaches for revitalizing our cities so the three approaches are first one is accommodation of all migratory tasks so it is about uh, it is more inclusive that we need to accommodate whoever is coming into the city so it, it became a house for all who, who are entering into the city but it is practical uh, feasibility is a biggest question mark and the second one he is recommending which is more draconian and uh, says that those who are having employability and the home can stay in the city allowing entry and the civic facilities only to those who with either home or employment so this aspect is very much draconian uh, with respect to the social scientists and all the third uh, approach author says design incorporates all the in essential elements of habitation here home and the economy part and the recreation and the institution also all these needs to be merged in terms of a weave it, it needs to express a carpet weave it's way it's to be woven very finely so uh, so how he is uh, visualizing it is not depend on the import of western model but we need to look on the african way so the two towns he is pointing is lagos and kumashi these two are migrant towns and located in the uh, coastal areas of Africa. Here, economy is linked to the day-to-day -day minor endeavors. Like, uh, it has a space for uh, uh, nearby agricultural uh, produce can come into the city and they can um, vent out. So, 
it is a mix of agricultural town and rural outposts and the mix of cosmopolitan at the center stage so it shows how a city can be life accommodating all aspects so what is the way uh, the way forward to rebuild our cities the first one is municipal government should recognize the informal settlements as a special zones of social interest so it is a responsibility of the municipal governments it is a very basic step upon the first step in this long plan process and the second one is as legal protection and the prevent forced eviction and uh, stop deterioration of living condition of these poor people is the very next step should be followed and the third one is we need to increase the floor space index of the houses in urban urban people urban cities so we need to increase the floor space index and the fourth one is follow up of developmental process so good start as a good end and we need to follow up for uh, continuing continuing the good end and the next one is uh, every process we are allocating for projects and all needs to be very transparent and the participatory so it ensure uh, and apart from this timely completion of the projects whether we are giving to ppp or we are uh, providing special purpose vehicle so it needs three components participation and transparency and the timely completion of the projects and the last one is we need to focus on the migrants the focus on migrants we are missing as of now we need to uh, collect the data of the migrant entry and the nature of migrants and the coming in coming in and going out of the city and the next one is changing pattern of the demographic divide within the cities need to be addressed because our profile of cities are not uniform all over the country or all over the states even on more urbanized states uh, like southern states they have so many variations in the with respect to cities itself so we need to have this data so next one is transport architecture are uh, catering to the needs of urban and as well as suburban so either it is metro or it is a shared car or uh, two wheelers or uh, buses we need to focus on that so how we are utilizing technology in the traffic network like uh, it is maintenance or uh, man maintenance management everything prevention of waste management or reusing the waste management is a critical part in the, uh, rebuilding our cities so greener cities through solid waste management is our uh, criteria for sustainable living sustainable urban living so greener cities through solid waste management and it is highly essential for our sustainable urban living next aspect is we need to think the urban value of life according to the value of our urban life structure of the urban cities needs to be changed and the uh, last one is governmental policies and the implementations like smart cities and all uh, needs to incorporate uh, these aspects to make our cities more inclusive let us move on to the previous year question related to this topic so in this year 2017 question is asked, asked about migrant entry indirectly so the question is growth of cities as a it hubs has opened up new avenues for employment so it is educated migrants entering into the city but also created new problems substantiate the statement with the examples it's for 250 words and the next question in 2016 with a brief background of quality of urban life in india introduce the objectives and strategies of the smart city program it is a direct question about the smart cities let us move on to the next article which came on january 30th the article is about a pivot in asia so the article says role of india and us in the indo pacific region so it is a modified version of pivot to asia given by obama it is again a one more international relation topic like uh, paper 3 gs2 which came in our syllabus we all know that in 2011 obama introduced a pivot to asia policy with india as its linchpin and now again under trump administration an epivot in asia has been introduced and again india as its linchpin so it is concerning our international affairs so we need to focus more on this article what is this outline of the article so recently national defense strategy and national security strategy of us released a, a document both documents focuses on and the indo pacific region that is a return of america to the indo pacific ocean and third one is crucial policy for india and the region so it is inviting india to join in this pro process so it is in simple terms rebalance to asia so why trump focuses on rebalance to asia so here 
First, we know that China's territorial and maritime aggression and in the uh, Indo-Pacific region is very high as of now and very high with respect to South China Sea and Trump wants to counter it. And the second irritant for Trump is North Korea. So regional instability due to North Korea needs a solution. And the third one is rise of Asian economies in terms of international trade and commerce. So Trump don't want to miss this opportunity. And the f fourth one is as of now Trump withdrawn from the TPP Trans-Pacific Partnership. So now he wants to engage more in the multilateral forums and the bilateral forums rather than this Trans-Pacific Partnership. So why India as its linchpin? Trump want to utilize the Quad architecture effectively to counter China. So one side it is Japan, one side it is Australia, one side it is US and one side it is India to counter the China factor. And the next one, he believes that India becomes a major defense partner. Uh, so we, he needs to make India as an ally as of now in this doctrine. And the third one is he needs to counter the Belt and Road Initiative by providing support to India. And India also to be more cautious as when it is running into the Indo-Pacific Ocean. As of now, it is evolving a major regional player, Indo-Pacific region. And it also knows the loss in the immediate neighborhood because of Chinese loan diplomacy and uh, infrastructure. So India needs to weigh the pivot in Asia and align with its Indian interests so that it will be fruitful to India's, uh, India's foreign policy and its international relations. 21st century, Asian century now becomes a reality. So India must capture this op opportunity to become itself a consensus builder and net security provided to this region. So let us move on to the previous year question uh, related to this topic. This year 2017, China is using its economic relations and positive trade surplus as tools to develop potential military power status in Asia. In the light of this statement, discuss its impact as her neighbor. So the question is directly on Chinese aggression and its impact in India. So we can expect uh, pivot, how pivot in Asia can counter the China. So we can expect uh, how uh, pivot in Asia can counter the Chinese aggression in the Indo-Pacific region. Prepare well. All the best. Thank you.